Marcus Davenport, Josh Oliver, and a whole bunch of former Vikings, pay cut Vikings. We have so much news to get through. Welcome to the Lockdown Vikings podcast. You like that on three, one, two, three. You, like it! you are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, 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 welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, your pal, and the Katie Copied Off in Math Class. My name is Luke Braun. You can find me on Twitter at Luke Braun NFL. Show is on Twitter at Locked On Vikings. And thank you so much for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day, especially during this insane time in the off season. You can also find the show on Amazon Fire or Roku. Just download the Locked On Minnesota Sports app. And today on the show, we just got, we got to recap everything. It's Tuesday. Usually that would be Twitter Tuesday. I do want to do a mailbag with everybody, uh, but we'll wait for things to chill out a little bit first um, because we have so much stuff to get through. We just don't have time for questions. So put a pin in that. Um, The Vikings made two signings in the opening day of the pre-negotiation window. Free agency has not opened in earnest yet. They don't need to be cap compliant or anything yet, but they can still negotiate and basically handshake deals with people. There's nothing stopping anybody from backing out of that deal like Anthony Barr did all those years ago. Um, But for all intents and purposes, these are signed players who will be Vikings and all the cap stuff will just kind of have to sort itself out by Wednesday, depending on what order of operations you do things in. So the first one, is Marcus Davenport, former Saints edge rusher, who played out his whole rookie year, whole rookie deal there, and signs with the Vikings for one year, thirteen million. The other one is Josh Oliver, who I will talk about next. Marcus Davenport's deal. All I know about it right now is that it is one year, thirteen million. We don't have a lot of information about the structure. If there are void years, if there's incentives, if that's all, what kind of money that is. I don't know if it's just salary or if there, what's guaranteed or what's in a signing bonus or whatever. All of that stuff matters um, in terms of like what the cap hit actually is. I don't know if the cap hit is actually thirteen million or if it's spread weirdly uh, or how much of it is tied up in what. So. We'll have to get that information later. In terms of Marcus Davenport, I want to get a better sense for Marcus Davenport from somebody who knows a little more about him than I do. So welcome in Ross Jackson at Ross Jackson. N-O-L-A does the Locked on Saints podcast. And of course, my co-host on Locked on NFL on Tuesdays. Whoop, whoop. Good buddy, Ross. What's going on? Man? <laughs> hey, oh, yeah. buddy. So... Why do Saints fans hate Marcus Davenport so much? <laughs> Let's just get right into it. Tell yeah. me that I, I I know he's been injured. I know you traded two first round picks for him. Uh, is it is it a uh, uh, you overpaid and it's kind of the anger of that, or has he been like why did he only get a half sack last year? Yeah, like th- some of it's not all his fault, right? Like some of it is that yeah, I mean you attach as an organization the New Orleans Saints attach effectively two first round picks and an additional like late round selection in order to move up in that 2018 draft to draft him. And then he just kind of never lived up to that insanely high level of expectation that balances that draft capital. And so I think that's a big part of it. I think the injuries frustrate fans a lot. I mean, he misses a lot of practices. He's oftentimes, you know, ends up having to walk out of games or leave games, things like that. But I mean, the guy had a nine and a half sack game just two seasons ago, followed that up with a half sack last year. Sorry, nine and a half sack season just two seasons ago. Just two seasons ago. Yes, not game. My apologies. My apologies. Yes, that's Madden numbers. That would be fantastic. Uh, (laughs) That would have changed everything about the way that Saints fans saw him. But, you know, he had that season a couple of years ago to everybody said, okay, maybe he finally turned the corner. Then that offseason, he had, you know, a part of his you know, half of one of his fingers amputated and he had like some other injury concerns and things like that. And then came back last season, same scheme, same system, same everything and had a half sack. He had more ejections in 2022 than he had sacks in 2022. And so not a great sort of situation for him at all. And so that's a, that, that means, so some of it is like the expectations that were lofty around him, but some of it is the performance uh, and availability concerns as well. So do you think that playing through those injuries made him incapable of playing at that same level? Or is there something deeper going on? He like didn't... if we make the bet, hey, if he stays healthy, he's a superstar. Like, is that even true? Or is there something else there? 
I think there is something else there because he didn't really play through injuries. I mean, you know, he kind of got nicked up and then he would go missing for three, four weeks and everything. Mm. And so, you know, it was always that kind of thing. It wasn't really a situation to where you saw him and kind of went, oh, okay, well, he's trying to play through an injury and things like that. And maybe things aren't as good and everything. Now, he, the the finger, ampu- the, the, the half amputated finger happened because, you know, that was a, uh, he had, it was a pain source it was like an as tolerated thing that over time that sort of like bone chip just became an issue. And so they amputated it. And then all of a sudden, like now he doesn't have that pain anymore. So maybe that, you know, there was the thing that maybe was expected to help him in 2022, but it didn't. And so it, it really is just sort of this whole little, you know, perfect storm of unavailability, um, lack of conditioning in some cases, him showing up out of shape and stuff like that. But then also the the last piece being that he didn't have a consistent level of production. So maybe the change of scenery helps. Maybe a different scheme helps to get what is just absolute raw athleticism, talent, traits. He has all of it, just hasn't ever been able to put it together in New Orleans. Doesn't mean he can't in Minnesota. Right. And and this is a one year deal, 13 mm-hmm. mil. As of this recording, I don't have any contract details. Maybe I'll wait and, and do the rest of the podcast when I do, or we'll mm-hmm. update you all when I have it. Um, but it, uh, no matter how you slice it, that's a prove it deal. Oh, yeah. Um, Big time. Yeah. For an edge rusher in, in this day and age, 13 mil is is kind of a, a, a prove it deal. So if he does put it together, maybe he goes and gets a big signing elsewhere or something like that. But um, I guess if he does put it together, what kind of edge rusher does that look like? Is this a power guy? Is this a finesse guy? Is this a, a speed mm. rusher? Is this a versatility kind of like what sort of guy are we getting here in terms of just on field style? Yeah, he's a speed to power converting uh, edge rusher. I mean, that that's really what he does. He's the type of guy that will bull rush and push the opposing teams. Uh, the Saints had him rushing off of the right tackle side. So, you know, he's the kind of guy that will push a right tackle into the lap of the opposing quarterback. Like that's that's who Marcus Davenport is. And there are times where he is just a man on fire and it makes Everything just comes together and you see it. And I'll tell you what, too, he's also very stout against the run. I mean, and and that's where the athleticism really shows, especially when he's playing in shape and he's playing sort of in that 270 to 280 area where he really excels, where he has the mass to have that speed to power conversion work his way, but also has the speed and agility to be able to get around the edge, bend, do everything that he's got to do in terms of uh, locking down the edge in the run game, uh, chasing quarterbacks that get outside of the pocket, all of that, especially if things start to turn over to Jordan Love and everything. So like, there's a lot of those pieces for him to where he does a little bit of everything, but his trademark is that speed to power conversion has never really been able to put together a string of pass rush moves. So he's kind of got to win on that first move, but if he's able to develop that a little bit more then that's something that you're going to want to watch for him in Minnesota as well. I see it's yeah, it seems like this is the the move the Vikings are making, but um, we'll of course have to see if he can put anything together in Minnesota that's better than what he put in New Orleans. Ross, thank you so much for giving me the quick lowdown on uh, Marcus Davin. I guess w- one more question. Yeah, yeah. With his regard to his injuries, are any of those injuries things that should be long term concerns or was it just man, he just kind of keeps getting little stuff or is is there a, a a major ligament problem that we have to be worried about flaring up again? Anything specific? Yeah. I think the ACL, ACL injuries in his history are something to watch. The knee injuries are going to be something to watch. But I mean, in today's NFL and in this day and age, it's just when you're talking about these big guys that are asked to move and change direction and all that, that's just not out of the ordinary anymore to have to ask that question about that style of player. So, you know, some of it is stuff that could be recurring. Some of it is just kind of like knickknack type stuff that happens uh, or nicked up, knacked up type of things that happen. But those would be the ones that I'd be a little bit more concerned about are kind of the lower body ones. But outside of that, like, I mean, as long as he gets to a point where he can start to play through those types of injuries, which maybe is just taking care of his body a little bit more, all of that, that he should be able to do that. I do hope that he, you know, comes on in Minnesota the way that he wanted to in New Orleans. Because I will tell you this, there was absolutely no shred of lack of want when it comes to Marcus Davenport. The guy wants to be dominant. He wants to be elite. He wants to be one of the best to ever do it. So, like, if you wanted somebody there that's going to give you effort, Marcus Davenport's 100% that guy. It's just where does that effort meet what his body is allowing him to do? Where does that effort meet the consistency? Those are the things you're going to be looking for. Excellent. Ross, thank you so much for your time. Real pleasure, buddy.
Once again, you can find Ross on uh, Locked on Saints, and I highly recommend it. Locked on Saints is a good time. I want to talk to you about Josh Oliver as well. I also got Kevin Ostreicher from Locked on Ravens to kind of do the same thing and, and like give me the lowdown. Um, so we'll talk to him and then also keep you updated on all the other stuff and talk a little bit about like how are the Vikings figuring this out with the salary cap? Did that stop, stop existing? And of course, the answer is no, uh, but I'll keep you posted on how all that is going. But first, let me talk to you about a good old gramble. This is FanDuel. FanDuel is America's number one sports book, and that is because new customers get a no-sweat first bet, up to $1,000 in bonus bets, even if you screw up on your first bet. So you can go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to get that at FanDuel. You can bet on everything from basketball games, both college and pro, hockey. Uh, you can bet on all kinds of crazy stuff, tennis and darts and all sorts of stuff. The XFL. All right, the Roughnecks have been real good money for the first part of the year, so you could go bet on that. Uh, and you can bet everything from the money line to spreads, point scorers, um, player props, even jam it all together in one big parlay. Try to get a better payout. Get a better payout. Once again, don't miss that chance to get that no sweat first bet. If you are new to FanDuel, by going to FanDuel.com/slash locked on, you can get up to one thousand dollars in bonus bets. That is. FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Thanks again for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day. Let's move right ahead to uh, Josh Oliver. Josh Oliver is a tight end that was most recently with the Ravens, spent a lot of time with the Jaguars as well. He was drafted by them, so he's been in the league for like five or six years now. And he had a very interesting story, but... I think I'd rather let Kevin tell it. So to help me out to understand who Josh Oliver is, I'm bringing in Kevin Ostreicher, who does Locked On Ravens, knows uh, Josh Oliver much better than I do. So I need the lowdown. Kevin, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and I feel like for, for this move, Vikings fans might be freaking out a little bit because it's almost like a who is this guy type of move. Because yeah. I feel like only Jaguars fans and Ravens fans know who he is at this point but i do want to calm some nerves and say i think this is actually a pretty solid signing for what the vikings might use him as in this offense that's tj hawkinson yeah so he'll be next to tj hawkinson and he will be tight end too he will be so my, my understanding is he's a blocking tight end but that's not how he came out in the draft so can you give me that story a little bit so i kind of know like what we're really like getting into yeah, so it's funny because all of you are right. He came out of college at San Jose State as more of like his comp was a big slot receiver, like had the receiving tools, huge athlete, great athletic upside, showed it off at the combine, was drafted to Jag actually a third round pick of the Jaguars back in 2019. So he had value in that draft, but then it was injuries. The story for him was injuries. Only played in three right. games his rookie year, missed all of his second year with another injury. So the Jaguars end up just cutting bait. They trade him to the Ravens, a conditional seventh round pick. And that condition ended up being if he made the roster, the Jags would get that pick. And if he didn't, then Baltimore would just retain it. So it was really a such a low risk, high reward move yeah. for the Ravens. Didn't really do a ton during his first year in Baltimore. But then this past year in 2022, the Ravens had to kind of move him into more of a blocking role. And he was really good at it. I mean, coming out of college, he didn't really have those tools. He had to learn on the fly. But he ended up having to move into that role because Nick Boyle, who was their blocking tight end, ended up getting injured back in 2020 and just never fully was able to get back on the field. So Oliver playing next to Mark Andrews and playing next to Isaiah Likely ended up being a really big part of their offense. And now I know people will probably look at the receiving stats and say only 14 receptions last year, 26 for his career. And you're giving that guy 21 million, but he now has rounded himself into an all around tight end where he's not the best tight end in the league, but he still gives you, I think a quality tight end too. And if you're going to play him in that role, not be, you know, this tight end one, you have to rely on him to catch 50, 60 passes a season. If you can count on him for 20, 25, 30 passes while also bringing in his blocking skills, I think with what he already has and just the athletic tools that you really, I mean, you can't teach those. I think, again, it's a solid signing for Minnesota. It's interesting because TJ Hawkinson, I mean, he's our tight end one. He did get, I think, almost 70 passes and he joined uh, like for just the Vikings and he joined in week nine. So he's a he's our volume guy. And I guess we're looking for for a role player. Um, and, and I think it's just a matter of like, is that too much for a role player, which I think I just have to think more about, um, which I will probably think more about than do the rest of the, the podcast at, later. Um, 
So is there a medical concern? Because he did have a lot of injuries early in his career, or is that is he well past that? I think he's past it at this point. I mean, injuries happen in football, but he was relatively right. healthy for as Baltimore. much as anybody. Right, for sure. But it, it, I think for what he suffered and what he went through his first couple of seasons, it was nothing like that in Baltimore. So I wouldn't be as concerned about that. I think you have to always just be cautious and worry of it, especially when a guy does go through what he went through in those first couple of seasons. But all in all, I think for Minnesota, I, I wasn't expecting him to get the deal that he got, but I don't think it's a massive, like massive was. overpay. Yeah, because again, yeah. it's one year of proven production where, you know, he's a, he's now going into his fifth year and he only had the one year in Baltimore in 2022 where it's that proven. So I was expecting maybe a two year deal, not necessarily, but this just proves, you know, Minnesota believes in him. Right. They believe he can be a fit next to TJ Hawkinson in that offense. And for Baltimore, a reason why they probably let him walk here is one. I don't think they could have even afforded to give him this deal with the way the Lamar Jackson situation is playing out But with a new offense and Todd Munkin. This wasn't like, I don't think this was the Ravens didn't like Josh Oliver and didn't think he could be productive. I think it was just the Ravens have Mark Andrews. They have two young guys and Isaiah likely and Charlie Kohler. I think Josh Oliver was just the odd man out mm -hmm. as opposed to the Ravens just wanting to get rid of him and have another team go after him and get him. And, and he was a, his contract expired. So he's a compensatory free agent right now. This means the Ravens are looking at a sixth round pick for him in the formula. Although a lot has to uh, go down before that actually locks in, but the Ravens are pretty good at comp picks. So I have a feeling that <laughs> they had none this year, kind of none this year, which is a huge, for the first time shift. in like forever, it's a shift. So right? already, you know, as we're recording here, two comp picks on the board, assuming everything stays the way it is probably won't, but right. You know, I think Eric DeCasa probably misses those those comp picks and is trying to get as much as they can for in the in the next year's draft year. <laughs> they're, they're Jonesing. Yeah, right, exactly. Well, Kevin, thank you so much. Uh, let Vikings fans know where they can find you if they want to know more about what the Ravens are up to. We are watching Lamar Jackson. Yeah. I think we're a long shot for him. Yeah, no, absolutely. You can find me over, obviously, on Twitter at ChaosTricker34. I do host and produce Locked on Ravens. We're there five days a week. So I will be talking a bit of Josh Oliver, just what that departure means for the Ravens and the fit a little bit in Minnesota on the episodes throughout the week. So if you want to find out that and got get more Josh Oliver details, you can you know subscribe on YouTube, follow along in audio form, the whole nine yards there. Thank you so much, Kevin. And once again, you can find Kevin on Locked on Ravens. Um, so Josh Oliver was a really interesting one because when I recorded that, I did not know the contract structure, but I actually have it now. So we can go over it here. And I'm not going to like inundate you with details. You can look all that stuff up at over the cap. I'll just, I'm going to give you the cap hits and what it would save to cut him in each year. I think that's the number that most of you care about the most. So in 2023, this year, he will cost three and a half million dollars. Not so bad. Uh, next year, he'll cost seven point one million dollars, which is kind of the the average that everybody's freaking out about. Oh no, seven million for a blocking tight end. He'll cost seven million next year. If cut, you can save two point four of that, and he'll be left. I think it's four point seven is what that's that leaves over. I'm rounding a bunch. Um, that, which would be dead money, a bunch of prorated bonus acceleration, all that stuff. Uh, and in 2025, his cap hit is $10.4 million, but you save eight of it if you cut. So if he plays here for two years and gets cut, that is two years, about $13 million, which is, you know, six and a half a year, which feels a little bit more reasonable. But again, the total value and average annual value are going to just give you a weirdly, uh, like inflated sense of what the money is. And I think that's just because our brains have a really hard time looking at eight digit numbers and being like, that's kind of small, <laughs> which like, I don't know, this deal to me feels fairly small. Seven million, what it used to be six and a half million, what it used to be. Um, in 2024, when he makes $7 million, that will be about 2.7% of the cap. He'll be about a million dollars away from making one fifty third of the cap and just being like, if you equally distributed the money to every player, this is role player money. It's not insignificant. It's not nothing. It's not, you know, a veteran minimum, but it's role player money. It's money for a guy that you don't expect to be on the field every play, uh, that you expect to kind of do a job, but just only that job and, and not have other utilities. And that's what I think the Vikings are trying to get. It's both of these signings with Davenport and Oliver, to me, feel like a little bit bargain bin hunting, right? Um, 
you're kind of grabbing a tight end too, and and he's going to be a role player, and it's not this is not going to break your bank, and it's not going to define your roster. And with Davenport, it's more expensive, thirteen mil. That's not that much for an edge rusher, but it's still like a market contract. It's it's you know significant significant money enough where like this feels like it precludes you from keeping Zadaria Smith on the roster. Although I am not a hundred percent sure on that, it just feels a lot like it, right? Um, but we haven't heard that that's the case yet, which is interesting. You know, usually you would think that would, that would be the case. Um, but I guess I'm a little bit more skeptical as to like, I don't think the Vikings expect either of these guys to come in and be superstars, right? Certainly not with Josh Oliver. And I think with Davenport, there's a hope that he comes in and he like makes good on all that athleticism Ross is talking about and stuff. But that's like a reclamation project. I feel like it's a little steep for a reclamation project, but I only know the total value of the contract. I have no idea how it is comprised, and therefore I don't, I, I, I can't really tell you like this is the strategy, because usually the strategy is revealed by the structure of the contract, and I just don't know that right now. Um, but I'll, we'll get to it when we get to it. It's funny with Davenport, you kind of you either know him as the guy that Saints fans hated a bunch or you know him as, oh, that guy I really liked coming out because <laughs> he was such a popular prospect coming out as like a super toolsy edge rusher. Um, and I feel like that will cover your perception a lot. And I didn't have a lot of exposure to either of these things. And so for me, he just kind of feels like, oh, OK, he's a reclamation project. He's just he's a guy that is hasn't lived up to any potential and we think we can get that out of him. We think we can keep him healthy and, and get him, you know, to put it together. And then if he doesn't, he's gone after the next year. So I guess the risk is mitigated, but it's a lot of money for a mitigated risk. Um, it's very un Spielman. Spielman would never, I, I he, he didn't really do this a lot with guys that have this low a floor. If he was going to take like a swing on someone that like a Dayton Jones, it was going to be something that if it did bottom out, it like will not hurt you. Uh, you know, he, Dayton Jones gets cut before camp and it just like did not matter. Um, this feels like, like there is a, a scenario here that punishes the Vikings. Now, risk reward, cost benefit and all of that stuff. It like probably makes sense with the math to take that risk, but this is definitely going to be something like the way that Quasi takes risks is probably going to be more susceptible to that punish but I mean, of course, you know, that doesn't mean that it's a bad idea or anything. It just means that there's like an actual real punish to it rather than Spielman, who would maybe rob himself of opportunities for big rewards in fear of that risk. There's total pros and cons to this. It's just a stylistic difference that I'm pointing out here that I've found interesting. Um, but there's a, a whole bunch of other stuff to do. Oh, my goodness. We have to talk about Hicks taking pick up. We have to talk about where like Dalvin Tomlinson and Patrick Peterson signing with other teams. Crazy stuff. So let's get into all of that. Uh, but first, let me talk to you about the best tasting protein bar on the planet. It is March. And that means Built Bar is doing their Built Madness thing, which is like a tournament of all of the flavors. Uh, personally, I, I coconut brownie chunks is going to go all the way. It's just, it is the flavor. It's, it's, the, it's the one, one, it's the one a, it is the thing. Um, so I, I don't know. That's where my vote goes. If your go, yours goes a different place, be sure to let me know, but it's cooler than that. Go to builtmarchmadness.com and you can vote for your favorites. And when you do that, your favorite bar or puff will be entered into a drawing where 50 lucky Locked On listeners will get a free box of Built. Not only that, but one of y'all gets a 12-month subscription to Built. And you can have Built's best bars or puffs delivered monthly straight to your door. You got to try all this stuff. Best tasting protein bar ever, covered in 100% chocolate, low calorie, high protein, low sugar. You're not going to believe it. So go to Built marchmadness.com right now to vote for your favorite bar or puff and pick up a box while you're there. You can vote every day in March. So hop in and keep on supporting your pick. All right, let's wrap up some odds and ends here on the Locked On Vikings podcast. We talked about those two uh, those two signings a little bit. And I think more analysis can come in the coming days when things are a little more calm. But for now, I just got to wrap up like everything else that's going on. So in the morning on Monday, Jordan Hicks agreed to the pay cut. Last we talked, he was like thinking about it. He agreed to it. He took it. Um, I, we still don't know, or at least I don't know as of this recording, what the actual terms of that are. But I would assume uh, that it's, you know, substantial enough for the Vikings to be happy with it, right? 
Um, so it means Jordan Hicks will be staying as a Viking, which I certainly didn't see coming. That's a surprise to me. But I also, I just didn't think of a pay cut as an option because his contract was small enough where it just didn't feel like there was substantial room. I was clearly wrong about that. Um, so he will stay at a reduced salary. It's really difficult for me to come up with an opinion on that because, look, Jordan Hicks at the vet minimum, everybody would take that. Jordan Hicks at, you know, a $6 million base salary, $6 million cap hit or whatever it was, um, obviously a, a much tougher pill to swallow. Somewhere in between those is, you know, your line for what you think is acceptable, and I have no idea if Jordan Hicks is above or below it. Um, but you, you can assume that there's... He did have $1.5 million guaranteed, so I would be very surprised if the pay cut went below that. He might have just said, I'll just take my guaranteed money, but I'll still play for you because I would rather not, you know, risk the market and risk maybe missing a training camp because I don't get signed till, you know, mid-July or missing OTAs because I don't get signed till mid-July. Um, you know, having teams wait till after the draft and then I have my uncertainty. I don't know where I'm going to live, where I'm going to play. Uh, players might not want that. Uh, or he might have said, oh, you know, I'll, I'll take two and a half mil as a base salary. And, uh, you know, that, that would mean like, I think a little over four mil as a total cap hit, which is pretty trivial in this particular cap environment. Um, not like totally trivial, but like, yeah, it's a small amount. Um, and it, it could be that, but obviously if we find out, oh, he took a pay cut, it was worth $750,000. We can still be kind of mad about that, but it sounds like Jordan Hicks and Brian Osamoa, those are your linebackers. So I don't anticipate the, the Vikings going out and signing an off ball linebacker. Like I thought they would when they cut Kendricks and I kind of assumed they were cutting Hicks as well. I think your starters are Hicks and Osamoa. Good luck. Uh, what that actually means schematically is pretty interesting because those guys are very, very different styles of linebacker and they'll probably have really specialized roles. Uh, but again, it's a conversation we'll save for another day when things are a little bit slower. Um, elsewhere, we're still waiting on Harrison Smith to make his decision on whether or not he's taking a pay cut or getting cut. Again, at least as of this recording, uh, it has to happen like by rule by uh, March 17th. I think a bunch of Harrison Smith's contract guarantees, but also by March 15th, the Vikings have to be cap compliant. So I imagine that's the real deadline there, uh, is assuming Harrison Smith is a part of uh, those discussions. Uh, and some former Vikings went places, which affects the compensatory formula in particular. Patrick Peterson signs with the Steelers and Dalvin Tomlinson signs with the Browns. The only nugget about that you need to care about is that their contracts were big enough to cancel out the compensatory picks that the Vikings were seeding by signing Josh Oliver and um, by signing Josh Oliver and Marcus Davenport. Um, so the Vikings are at an even no compensatory picks given or or gotten right now. Um, or they, they wouldn't actually give up any picks if they with the the, the comport formula. I don't want to accidentally misspeak and confuse anyone. They're they're at a zero. Um, but if, you know, Garrett Bradford goes and signs somewhere that would count toward the compensatory formula and the Vikings would actually get that pick rather than like having more space to make up. So that matters. If you uh, are interested in just following his career from here on out, Eric Kendricks will be a charger that doesn't have any impact on the Vikings, except for the fact that he will be on the chargers when the chargers visit us bank stadium this year. Uh, that should be interesting. Although the exit with Kendricks and um, Patrick Peterson on his podcast had all kinds of great things to say about the Vikings. It's a very amicable exit. It seems like uh, Eric Kendricks may have, you know, not been too, too happy about being cut, which is fair. Uh, but I don't think we're going to have any big revenge games, bitterness, at least I don't sense any right now. Um, and I also want to go over some stuff that's like rumor E that, uh, Darren Wolfson had on a, an appearance on climb the pocket. He, or on, on the climbing the pocket pocket, um, Vikings happy hour show that they do over there. They also, um, he also does scoops with, with score North. So you, you can get his thoughts pretty often. um, Basically, the thing he heard the most buzz about was the Vikings asking around about a lot of cornerbacks. Um, they did not get Cam Sutton. That was one of the names. He also was willing to mention the names Byron Murphy and Sean Murphy Bunting, but he was very clear that that's not it. Um, he also said there's definitely interest with Duke Shelley, but there's just interest in a lot of corners. So that whole corner market has to shake itself out, and we will end up with one of, with at least one of them, hopefully two of them. Um We'll end up with somebody around that cornerback market. Most of them have not signed yet. Uh, Jamel Dean went back to the Bucks. Uh, Cam Sutton went to the Lions. But the the market is still pretty full. It's pretty flush still. So we'll see who in there ends up being Vikings. Um, 
he, there was also, he said, there's a price point on bringing back Bradbury, which just means, okay, if, if Bradbury is willing to take a deal that's this or less, we'll bring him back, but otherwise we're happy to let him go if, if somebody wants to pay him more than that, which means he gets to go negotiate around, see the market, we'll see who wants to pay Bradbury, and if somebody does, well, he's in the comp formula, so at least that works. Um, and for whatever it's worth, Doogie thinks that there is somebody that will pay Bradbury more than that. He thinks the market will outdo the Vikings price point, um, but that's just speculative. There's also some buzz around Dalvin Cook being traded. Um, that has There's a lot of fake Dalvin Cook trade stuff that has gone around, so don't get got by that. But Darren Wilson did say that, like, yeah, it seems like that's the one trade that they're, like, actively engaging in. They've gotten calls about a lot of people, right? You know, everybody wants to call and see what the deal is with the Neil Hunter, but that doesn't seem like it's anything the Vikings have entertained. But they have entertained Dalvin Cook talks. Nothing Im imminent, nothing is there, but that's, if anybody is going to get traded, it's going to be him. Um, and I, that kind of brings me to, we got to talk about the cap a little bit, because the... Uh, the the Vikings are very confusing about the cap right now, and this is a moment where we don't know exact figures, so I can't tell you exactly how close they are to being under the cap or not or whatever. I don't know what Marcus Davenport's cap hit is this year. I know his total contract value is 13 mil, but I don't know how much of it counts against the cap in 2023. We know uh, that Josh Oliver is a 3.5 mil cap hit. Okay, we can put that on the books. We don't know what Jordan Hicks's cap hit is. We don't know what Chris Reed's cap hit is, who he took a pay cut as well over the weekend. I forgot to say that yesterday. Um, so w w there, there's some unknown numbers, so I can't tell you where they are uh, against the cap, but I will say that they were not all the way under before signing <laughs> Josh Oliver and Marcus Davenport, which then puts them further away. How much further away, I can't tell you, but further away, right? So they're waiting on this Harrison Smith deal. That's going to have a big impact. And I think Dalvin Cook will have a big impact as well, whether he's traded or cut or whatever. Um, for whatever it's worth with Harrison Smith, as we wait, Ben Gessling on KFAN said he gave it about a 4 out of 10 that Harrison Smith would be back. So I don't know, somewhere around. I don't really know, but I guess we're leaning that way is what that sounds like to me. Um, it sounds like what he was trying to say. So the... Every situation is like very fluid and we don't know a lot right now. Um, when we do know stuff, I will log it down and I will be able to talk to you about it tomorrow. But for now, trying to track the nickels and dimes of the salary cap is going to be just impossible. We just have to kind of like close our eyes and open them up again on like Friday and see where they're at. <laughs> Because I, I don't know what it's going to take to get under or what it isn't going to take to get under because I just I just we just there's variables we can't solve for. Um, but what we could do is kind of say like what that stuff would have to be. Uh, and I think that the Davenport cap hit can't be all 13 million. It doesn't feel like that's plausible. Um, but I, I don't want to speak too far out of turn and get too deep into speculating that it's it's not a fruitful exercise. We'll find out in like 48 hours. It'll be fine. Um so we'll just keep you keep you posted. If uh, things slow down, we'll do a mailbag. Uh, and if not, we'll just keep pushing it. So this is a very fun week. I hope you guys stick with me on the Locked On Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And as always, Skull.